All right, morning, everyone. Uh, let's begin. Uh, welcome to the next installment of the JKMRC Friday morning seminar series that take place here at the Indra Pili Lecture Theater, as well as online. Uh, my name is Katarina, and myself and Karina are co-chairs of organizing the seminar series and are taking turns introducing the speakers this year. Before we start, on behalf of the University of Queensland and the Sustainable Minerals Institute, we'd like to respectfully acknowledge all traditional owners and their custodianship on the lands of which we all meet today. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cult cultural and spiritual connection to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Our speaker today is Dr. Juliana Segura Salazar, who is a chemical engineer with a bachelor's degree from Universidad de Valle in Colombia and holds both master's of science and a PhD degree um, in metallurgical engineering from, um, I'm gonna say it in English rather than in uh, Portuguese, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Um, Juliana worked as a research assistant at Imperial's College Advanced Mineral Processing Research Group in the Horizon 2020 Impact Project. Uh, she still holds an honorary position with Imperial and is a steering committee member of the Imperial Lifecycle Network. And since 2021, Juliana has worked as an independent third party critical reviewer of life cycle assessment studies in the extractive sector. And she recently joined the SMI's Development Minerals Program, as well as the JKMRC as, um, as research fellow. Her multidisciplinary work in the Development Minerals Program and the Advanced Process Prediction and Control Group, otherwise known as APCO, within the JKMRC aims to address the global sustainability challenges related to sand supply and mine waste minimization through innovation such as ore sands. And today's presentation is titled Sustainability Driven Innovations in Mining, a Systemic Perspective. Take it away. Good morning and thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be part of this seminar series. And so today I want to talk uh, about the importance of adopting innovation in mining uh, in the sustainability context, but also from a holistic uh, life cycle perspective. Uh, we all know that um, our current patterns of development are very unsustainable and we are extracting much more than our planet can provide and also we are increasingly generating a, a, a huge amounts of waste. And, and mining has uh, contributed to several uh, social and environmental uh, effects in, in, in society, in the environment, and the local communities. And there are um, two key environmental aspects that I would like to highlight here. Uh, one is the contribution to climate change, both in a positive and in, in, in a negative way. Uh, as, as mining generates, uh, contributes to generate uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but also is uh, an, enable, an enabler of the transition to, to uh, renewable energy. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, the, the second critical aspect for mining is the collapse of tailings dams, which has also been recurrent over time. So, um, and this is why we need to change the paradigm in mining to try to move from the linear system that focus on uh, end of life, end of, uh, and, end of pipe solutions uh, to more proactive actions uh, in terms of uh, eliminating uh, or reducing as much as possible the waste generated and also uh, minimizing the or making more efficient the use of resources. And this is why sustainability and circular economy approaches are, are essential. So I want to start uh, talking a bit more about sustainability in mining and also uh, uh, innovation. Uh, we, uh, we know that uh, United Nations has uh, had 
a, a key role in, in terms of developing this, sustain, uh, this concept uh, related to sustainable development uh, over time. Um, we are also very familiar with the concept of a sustainable development proposed by the Rural Commission, uh, which seeks to meet the needs of the present and future generations, which means a, a, tem a, a time perspective. And also, uh, all, all this, this concept uh, has also evolved uh, over time to what we know uh, as the sustainable development goals that have, have been uh, increasingly used in, at different levels and in also in the mining sector, uh, uh, in, at academic and organizational levels, uh, the mining activities can be seen as contributing to improve several of, of those SDGs and also to mit mitigate uh, several social and environmental aspects, uh, negative aspects of mining operations. So, um, but there is also another conceptualization of sustainability uh, based on the triple bottom line or the three pillars of sustainability, which are society, economy, and environment. But uh, um, there are also uh, other authors that have also uh, proposed to, to increase the number of pillars, including uh, key components such as uh, governance, technology, uh, ethics, and also uh, even uh, they have proposed to integrate all these pillars uh, and also in a, on a time perspective in line with the rule and definition of sustainable development. So, um, and, and there is also another important concept for sustainability in the mining context, which is, is inspired by, by nature, is the life cycle concept and in, involves uh, two cycles, the life cycle of the mining project from exploration to uh, the commissioning, uh, rehabilitation and monitoring. And the second life cycle that intersects with the previous one, that is the life cycle of the product and is more directly related to the operation phase of, of the mine. Um, and also uh, relates to the value chain or value chain of the products. So um, as I will show later, the life cycle of the mining project has been mostly focused on the operation phase in, 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 from the life cycle assessment perspective. And there is also another point that I want to highlight here is that uh, at the early stage of development of a mine operation is where we have the greatest opportunity to improve sustainability, but we also have a, a high uncertainty uh, because we have a very limited information at this stage. So in summary, uh, sustainability in the minerals industry need, needs to be based on an ecocentric rather than an anthropocentric perspective, which means that uh, nature becomes the main pillar of sustainability and cannot be exchanged with other pillars. Otherwise, it will be considered weak sustainability. Um, it also involves proactive management and continuous stakeholder engagement throughout uh, both life cycles. It is also important to increase the awareness about not only primary, but also secondary resources management. Uh, and I think here at the JK, uh, uh, the, the BRC has done a very good job in terms of increasing the awareness towards uh, looking at the mine waste as a resource. And also uh, it's important to acknowledge the, the, the relevance of additional dimensions of the sustainability, such as the governance aspects and also the innovation and particularly technological innovation. And this, this conceptualization also needs to be viewed in different time and special scales and also uh, in line with the Brunland's definition of sustainable development. And it's also important to emphasize that um, 
it is necessary to adopt holistic approaches such as a life cycle assessment in order to achieve this comprehensive uh, concept. So uh, now I, I want to talk a bit more about uh, sustainability based on holistic thinking and also the importance of innovation in this context. And I will later illustrate this with some case studies. Uh, life cycle assessment and life cycle thinking is a methodology that can be considered relatively new. It, it actually started in the early 60s with some reports uh, conducted by industries and other sectors, but it was started to develop formally through uh, from the 90s uh, towards uh, the, the first decade of this century. And basically uh, it was promoted thanks to the, to the standardization uh, from ISO. And this methodology basically comprises uh, four stages. Uh, the, the first one is the goal and scope definition. Uh, the second one is uh, the inventory or life cycle inventory analysis. The third phase is the life cycle impact assessment phase and the fourth uh, stage is the interpretation phase so uh, and this it, this also uh, can this tool can also be applied uh, for for promoting products also for policy making uh, for diagnosing uh, your operation it has a, a, a wider scope of application so uh, we can see here uh, with an example how this methodology works uh, if you consider a car as a product, uh, you, you have to, in this goal and scope phase, you have to define what, uh, which type of car are you going to evaluate, which, uh, where, in, in which country, which region, uh, are you also going to consider the use phase of, the, of this car or just the production. So all these things are defined in, in the first stage of the methodology. And the second phase is, pro is perhaps the most critical and the most relevant uh, where, because it's, uh, it's where you need to collect a vast amount of data uh, in terms of all the inputs and outputs that are related to your system. Uh, and, and it involves exchange between uh, anthropogenic systems, but also exchange with nature. And in the third phase, uh, the life cycle impact assessment, we basically translate all those inputs and outputs in potential environmental impacts. And this can be done by using some environmental models uh, and that are basically applied using some characterization factors. And, all, uh, and we, uh, through this, uh, we can monitor different uh, impact categories such as climate change, eutrophication, land use, water use, and, and several others. Uh, some of the methodologies for, uh, in some impact categories are, are better than others uh, in terms of methodology, uh, more accurate. Um, and, there, and you can also uh, group uh, those categories in, in uh, areas of protection, which are called uh, endpoints. Um, but this is, uh, sometimes this is not recommended to do because uh, there is an increased uncertainty in, in this process. So uh, probably uh, you, it will be more helpful for interpretation of the results to have more uh, a small number of categories but on the other hand you are making much more assumptions in the model so it can improve the uncertainty of, of, of your interpretation and yeah the final stage is the is where you analyze all those results and try to make use of them on, on the best way possible and then also important to 
acknowledge that uh, this, the, the definition of the boundaries of your system is very critical and it, it will influence the results of your study. So you, uh, in, in, in the mining sector, it's frequent to find, define the system as a cradle to gate, which means that we cover the, the stage from the extraction of resources to transportation and, and production uh, of a, a metal or of a, or concentrate or a mineral product such as aggregates. And beyond that, there are also some uncertainties in, in the modeling, uh, but it, it is also uh, important to highlight the need to extend the boundary towards uh, the end of life management of, of the waste uh, in, from a circular perspective. And that is what we call a cradle to cradle. And this framework uh, based on the three pillars of sustainability has also been uh, used to propose a holistic uh, framework for sustainability assessment based on, on the environmental life cycle assessment methodology that I have been introducing here and that I will do more emphasis on, on this pillar. But there are also other two methodologies that ha need to be more explored in mining and in general, which are uh, life cycle costing and social life cycle assessment. So uh, we can say that uh, basically uh, the economic and social dimensions from a life cycle perspective have been overlooked and also uh, those methodologies need to, uh, need to be more applied uh, and also need require more maturity in, in terms of methodological aspects. Uh, and, the, and, the, and those two are not uh, standardized by ISO, but there are some uh, useful guidelines uh, to apply those tools. And also uh, uh, we can say that um, the current, uh, the, the present moment is actually the the decade of consolidation of this methodology, and there is a lot to be done. In, in, in terms of environmental LCA, it is, it's very, it's quite robust right now, but it still has some limitations and issues that need to be addressed. One of the challenges uh, in mining has been the, uh, that the neglection of some of the stages of the life cycle uh, as I mentioned before, the life cycle of the mining project in yellow is, is usually not considered uh, because it's actually difficult to get this information, but it's possible to make some, to obtain some data to try to get some estimates at this stage. And in, in the operation phase, which uh, is the, in, uh, the square in the inner square, um, we have some uh, of the states of this operational life cycle that are also usually neglected, such as uh, management of waste and, or, or water and the use of the land. In, in the context of LCA, it's also important to, to recognize uh, the importance of using additional tools to to improve the methodology. Uh, I have been working uh, a lot with uh, improving the methodology at the inventory level stage uh, through the use of process simulation because the, it, it allow us to obtain a, a better quality of data for the inventory phase and, and uh, which is also very relevant at the early stage of development of an operation. So, um, and there is uh, the circular economy paradigm that I have also mentioned is also very, uh, LCA is very important in order to support the decision making towards circularity. And circular economy also has uh, many definitions and, but it has mainly been associated with the concept of zero waste hierarchy um, which, also has very different re representations in the literature, 
but basically means that you go, you have an inverted pyramid and you, you are trying to uh, attempt to move from uh, a reactive to a more proactive perspective, uh, trying to avoid or redesign your uh, processes or your business models or standards, regulations, and also attempting to, to reduce the waste rather than dealing with the, the waste. But it's also important uh, to, to propose solutions for the current waste that we have historically generated. So reuse and recycling and recovery approaches are also relevant. And in, in the mining context, uh, it, 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 there is also a lot to be done in, in this regard. Uh, well, now I want to, to demonstrate the, the importance of adopting the sustainability and, and life cycle perspective concepts in, in mining through a series of case studies, uh, more focus on environmental life cycle assessment and, and technological innovation. Um, so the, the first case is related to an iron ore operation in Brazil in the Iron Quadrangle region in Minas Gerais. Uh, uh, as you may know, Brazil is the second largest producer of iron ore globally. Uh, there are two types of ores, uh, the high grade or hematite ores and the low grade or etabrite ores. And the, 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 the latter are mainly produced in the state of Minas Gerais, where uh, actual, uh, where those uh, tailings uh, failures also, uh, tailings dams failures also happen in, in this region. Uh, so, uh, and, and we have seen a, a local trend that is also observed in a global context which is the progressive drop in iron grade of the run mine ores, which implies a additional beneficiation stage for etabrite ores compared to high grade ores uh, in order to produce pellet feed. And it also implies a higher amount of mine tailings uh, compared to the high grade ores, which implies also in increased uh, failure risks. So uh, the goal of, of this uh, case study was to support the development of more sustainable iron mining, iron ore mining projects in Brazil uh, through a pre-feasibility assessment of uh, comminution routes for uh, etabrite ores, but from a holistic perspective and uh, considering different technologies. Uh, the, the functional unit is a concept that I have put here because it's, it's key for a life cycle assessment studies. And it basically relates the function of, of your system and how you relate all those inputs and outputs of your system on a common basis. So in this case, yeah, we have selected a specific throughput and, and particle size, well, a, a, a target of 95% passing 150 microns. So the, the first uh, processing route that we see here is the most common for this type of force in Brazil and comprises four stages of crushing and two stages of conventional grinding, grinding with bone mills. The second route uh, involves uh, the use of a sack mill uh, in combination with a bone mill. The third one is uh, a route based on HPGR uh, in combination with bulk milling. And the fourth row is, is more uh, hypothetical. It hasn't been implemented yet in, in practice, in a real operation and involves, but it's based on pilot test work and involves a, a two stages of crushing uh, and uh, the use of a vertical roller mill. So uh, the, um, the, the first road is the, the most conventional and there is a lot of knowledge and experience on that road, while the, the last one is the, the most, mo most uncertain. 
Um, for this case, as this is a prefaciability study, we customized the lab cycle methodology in order to perform a streamlined study, uh, basically focus on, on, on the gate to on a gate to, to gate approach and also uh, considering a, a limited number of impact categories and, and only at the life cycle inventory stage. And also with the support of process simulation and uh, additional information. And in, uh, as a summary of this case, uh, it was found that uh, the HPGR road was the most beneficial from the environmental viewpoint in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and energy consumption. The, the, the SAC road did not seem beneficial compared to the base case. And the, the last road based on vertical roller mill was not par particularly favorable in terms of improving environmental performance and mainly due to the high energy consumption in the funds and the classification system. So uh, the, from the economic point of view, uh, it was found that the HPGR road uh, and the vertical roller mill road uh, were the, the, the best in terms of uh, in, in improving the net present value. And, and also can be seen that uh, those routes are also uh, favorable from several technical qualitative criteria. And I, there is also a specific um, um, characteristic that I would like to highlight is that uh, the last road, uh, despite not being uh, the best uh, in terms of environmental performance, it could be improved uh, through energy efficiency strategies and also uh, adopting uh, even more uh, clean uh, energy sources in order to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. And, and also uh, it, it's, it's very important because it is the only one that will allow to transition towards a, a dry processing route, which also is related to, to a potential uh, decrease in, in the risk related to tailings management. Now I'm going to go move to another case study. I, I have to, I'm just trying to provide you a quick overview of the cases, but more details can be found in the publications. The second case is based on a, a aggregate uh, operation in the metropolitan region of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Uh, large scale operations uh, in aggregates are very uncommon. Uh, in developing countries, uh, as, in, as in the case of Brazil, uh, it only represents the 3%. Uh, and, but uh, aggregates are necessary for local development uh, in, at global level. So, um, and the Southeast region, which is this corresponds to this case study, is one of the most developed. Uh, and also implies uh, an increased consumption of aggregates per capita. So uh, aggregates is the second largest mineral production in, in Brazil, but there is also a very poor management, uh, mostly landfilling of alternative sources of aggregates such as construction and demolition waste. Only uh, less than 1% of this uh, waste is currently recycled. So the objective of this uh, case study is to uh, evaluate the potential environmental impacts related to the life cycle of a large scale granitic quarry in the metropolitan region of Rio de Janeiro, and also try based on a current operation and also try to, to propose alternative scenarios with varying degrees of innovation. The base case uh, mainly comprises um, the, the, uh, the mining stage uh, with uh, blasting, uh, transportation of the runoff mine ore, and 
different uh, multiple stage of crushing and classification in order to produce a, diff, uh, a, a variety of products with different grading for the for construction applications. Uh, the system here was modeled uh, as, as best as possible uh, from a cradle to gate perspective. And it was also done with the support of process simulation, but from a mind to product perspective. And the, so the first scenario is considered as a business as usual case, and is the conservative approach and the, how the operation works right now. A uh, second hypothetical scenario it, it includes the mind to product optimization, which uh, can be seen as a technical innovation at corporate level that doesn't require a CAPEX, capex investment. The third uh, processing route is also involves uh, the adoption of technology such as impede crushing and conveying that will make a it will provide some flexibility to the operation. Uh, we know that this technology is not actually new, but it has been uh, marginally applied in, especially in developing uh, countries. So it can be seen as innovative from that perspective. Uh, so, but this of course implies an, an increased capex. Also, uh, some studies have demonstrated that, that it it can be uh, the OPEX could be could compensate uh, the, this high investment over time. And the fourth uh, processing route uh, is also hypothetical and, uh, and has an increased level of innovation because goes beyond all the previous roads and also incorporates the circularity paradigm. And the idea is also to make use of this technology on this improved mind to product optimization and also um, try to co-produce uh, uh, different aggregates using uh, by partially substituting the, the primary raw material source and, and recycling construction and demolition waste. This, this case study was, as I mentioned, a cradle to gate approach and used uh, also process simulation and uh, databases for the background processes that are linked to the value chain. And the OpenLCA software was used for uh, the life cycle assessment. Uh, as a summary of the results, it was observed a good uh, correspondence between the the simulated uh, road and the, the production data for the reference year uh, that was used for this case study, uh, which is a bit different from the design criteria that was uh, defined for this plant. It was also observed a, a good correspondence of the results of the base case compared to other cases and particularly to a, a Brazilian data set that is available in the EcoInvent database, database, which is, and there is a, a Brazilian process available there, which is an average of three operations in the state of Sao Paulo. And the results of that case were very similar to the base case here. As a, this is a kind of validation of, of the results of the base case. And additionally, it was observed that <clears throat> in terms of uh, the contribution of impacts in each scenario, it was observed that uh, in the first three scenarios, uh, the main contributors were the use of explosives in the blasting stage and the use of diesel in, in, in the mining stage in, in, and in transportation. So uh, the last scenario was the most different in terms of contribution analysis, because it implied an expanded system boundary, uh, incorporating uh, potential avoided impacts uh, related to avoided uh, landfilling, for instance, and avoided consumption of resources and potential recovery of additional products. 
Uh, so in summary, it was observed that the second hypothetical scenario improved the performance in several in impact categories up to 35%. The third case uh, was, which was an improvement, has, it has the improvements of the second case, uh, the mind to product approach, but also the use of impede crossing and conveying did not seem so favorable in terms of environmental impacts. And this was mainly due to the relatively short uh, transportation distance between uh, the the mining and the mining stage and the the processing plant. And the last case was the the one that implied the highest improvements in environmental impacts. But there is uh, there is a, a, an important aspect uh, which is related to the transportation distance from these waste. Uh, from the landfilling facility to the to the plant, and and this transportation distance becomes very critical in terms of of environmental impacts, and, and should be reduced as much as much as possible, because otherwise the this scenario could could not be <laughs> the best in, in compared to the base case. So, but it's, it's actually feasible in, in this particular context because uh, the plant is located on a, on, a, on a developed region and is close to several, uh, several cities that can potentially provide uh, this waste. So uh, then I want to also talk about a third case that was uh, also a recent work that I, in which I was involved uh, when I worked at Imperial College. Um, it was the Horizon 2020 impact project. And basically uh, it re uh, was very reliant on innovation. The idea was to develop a new mining paradigm at a small scale uh, to, in order to uh, exploit a, a small complex uh, deposits mainly focus on high grade in the European context. So uh, uh, it was uh, developed an uh, integrated modular containerized and flexible plan in order to facilitate the rapid deployment of the operations. And, uh, and this concept was put in practice in, in two different uh, mine sites. In, in the Balkans, in Bosnia and in Serbia. But today I want to focus in the first case, which is the olive oil mine in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, in order to, uh, to concentrate a suicide ore. Uh, it's important to, to see that uh, one of the innovations of this case was the development of a continuous miner in order to get rid of conventional blasting. So the objective of this case was to assess the environmental performance of the switch on, switch off mining uh, using evidence from pilot uh, scale testing uh, with the support of process simulation. In this case, uh, use impact was the software used for, for this purpose based on a um, mineralogical based approach uh, to, in order to model the concentration plant. And um, it, it was focused on a high-grade uh, lead uh, deposit, and yeah, and the and this the process uh, in this case comprised the use of the selective miner to um, follow it by the comminution module and uh, the and the gravity separation models and also uh, the fine uh, the fine tail tail management. Uh, the um, it was observed that in, in the environmental profile of this operation, uh, the highest contributors to the environmental impacts were the, the gravity separation and the base load and the watering stage, uh, which was a bit expected because uh, this plant relied on, on diesel generators. And also because as, as we don't have the effect of, of blasting, uh, the other uh, contributions become more relevant. 
So, uh, and the infrastructure in this particular case also has a, a, a considerable contribution to some impact categories. The, uh, there was also uh, established a hypothetical energy scenario, uh, which considered a mix of renewable energy and it optimized also from the economic viewpoint. And it was also observed that this alternative scenario improved uh, several, but not all the impact categories. And this is because there are some upstream impacts related to the um, production of uh, photovoltaic models that can uh, affect some of those categories. And this is why it's important to adopt the holistic uh, thinking in this type of solutions. In trying to avoid to shift the burdens from one category to another or from one uh, life cycle stage to another. And well, finally, I want to uh, talk, I just to mention a bit about my current research and my current role in the Orsans project in which I'm working with uh, Daniel Franz and with the Mosens group. Um, in terms of um, trying to produce an alternative sand that can contribute to to the sustainability improve the sustainability issues related to unsustainable sand extraction in especially in developing contexts and also to try to minimize as much as possible the risks related to tailings management so the idea here is, is not to repurpose waste as is frequently interpreted, and there is some confusion about this, uh, confusion about this, but uh, the idea is to move to the top of the pyramid and try to reduce the production of waste and, and instead try to generate a saleable product or co-product in this case such as uh, the sands in, in, the, in, in the case of metal mines, such as uh, the case uh, evaluated here, which was uh, a valley operation in the Minas, in the state of Minas Gerais in, in Brazil. So uh, part of this study also uh, performed a, a preliminary life cycle assessment study, and it was also observed that uh, there is a uh, great opportunity to potentially reduce environmental impacts of this alternative sand compared to other sands in Brazil and in other uh, regional contexts. But uh, a sensitivity analysis also showed that the transportation distance from the, from the production site, in this case, the mining operation, to the markets can also be critical in terms of, of the trade-off of impacts. So I, I, as a final remarks, I, I want to, I hope you have enjoyed the presentation and seen the importance of adopting a holistic view in sustainability assessment in the mining sector. Um, environmental life cycle assessment is particularly very robust and mature and uh, scientifically sound methodology to address um, potential environmental impacts, but is still marginally applied compared to other sectors such as agriculture. Uh, life cycle costing and social LCA, on the other hand, have a medium to low maturity level, especially social LCA, there are no, uh, uh, the, those methodologies ha have not been standardized by ISO, but um, there are useful guidelines. And there is also a very low uptake of those methodologies in mining. Um, it's also important to say that innovation is very, is, is fundamental to improve the sustainability in mining within this holistic paradigm. But innovation is not only uh, limited to the use of new technologies, but also to make a better use of the available technologies and also improve the current practices and the business models and, and integrate the methodology with, with other tools. 
and also um, is um, the methodology all, all these um, life cycle methodologies need to increase in application and the databases that are used to, to model those systems also need to be more populated, uh, especially in a wide range of commodities, mineral commodities, including critical raw materials. Um, and especially there is also a, a, a very few number of studies in uh, developed in the global south. So uh, the, and where, where uh, there has been an increase in, in, in the in mining operations. So this is a bit contradictory, but it's, it's, it's worth to mention that. And also uh, the, the scale of the system cannot just be restricted to, the pro to a part specific product, but also to extend to a, a regional context. And there are also many research gaps to be addressed, uh, such as uh, the improvement on, of some environmental impact categories for my, that are relevant for mining, such as land use, water use, uh, ecotoxicity related impacts. Um, and also uh, important to say that um, the, there is a need to focus on the secondary resources management within the mine and product life cycles, but uh, from a circular perspective. Uh, I'll talk uh, circular, adopting circular approaches does not necessarily mean that are the most sustainable. And, and, and the life cycle uh, approach uh, is very helpful to, to evaluate this, the sustainability of circular measures. And also, there are also other potential methodologies that can be integrated with LCA and other perspectives in terms of evaluating the, the effects of, for instance, of policies or market changes through consequential LCA. And, and also, uh, there is also a need to more systematically address uh, the variability of input parameters, which is, has been uh, marginally done in LCA studies, but, it, but has been approached through Monte Carlo simulation. So I, I would like to conclude here uh, the saying that I, I, will, I look forward to having more collaboration in the SMI in order to, to increase the application of and methodological improvement of, of these uh, holistic approaches. And well, I want to acknowledge uh, the project partners that uh, supported uh, our work in the impact project and also uh, want to acknowledge um, the uh, different collaborators and in Brazil and especially the laboratory of Tecnologia mineral and thank you so much for being here <laughs> Thank you, Juliana. That was a very good presentation. Um, and I think it comes timely as well. <laughs> do we have any, we do have questions in the audience. Thanks, Juliana, for, for nice presentation. Uh, I really enjoyed I mean, I, I learn a lot about life cycle, and I was I heard a lot about that, but I never seen it a presentation fully presentation about it. Thank thank you for that. Um, you mentioned and yesterday also we 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 talk about the ore sand project, and so I was wondering what is your uh, opinion about has anyone done life cycle or well, step back. Or to me is considered as abundant mineral. Like nature produces, there's a lot, lot sand around us. Uh, has anyone done life cycle analysis about uh, how much deposit of sands are around the world, at what rate nature generated annually, and what is consumption as and 
are we as a society uh, uh, are running to the scenario that that abundance minerals all of a sudden be, become scared, scarce? So, and we have to think about producing those. Uh, uh, that's a sand. Thanks. Thank you for the question. Actually, um, uh, as Daniel has mentioned before, the the, the development minerals, uh, such as uh, aggregates, have been uh, consistently overlooked in, in general uh, from the sustainability perspective and also in life cycle assessment studies. There are some data sets available uh, in terms of different products uh, worldwide. But there is still a lot, a lot to do in terms of quantifying impacts at wider scales and have, having more populated databases, especially in, as I mentioned, in, in, the, in the global South context. Well, yeah, I really enjoyed the presentation as well. I, I like the journey you took us on where you take, gave us a high level view of, you know, the life cycle of potentially a mine and the products and then take and gave us specific examples down in the detail. I'd like us, I'd like you to take us back to that high level and give us your perspective. What are your thoughts? Should the mining industry, mining people, like companies, start getting involved in how their products are used? Is that your view? Or perhaps should the mining companies maintain a life cycle view of their mine and really look at that problem of decommissioning and closure, which has kind of been left alone for for a long time what's your what's your perspective on that yeah actually thank you for the question uh, my mining companies need to innovate more and be more proactive in their from the early stage of the de design of the mines you know uh, trying to design for closure which it means uh, minimize uh, uh, waste as much as possible uh, take advantage of the value of the potential co-products that you can generate, as in this case, uh, or sons. Uh, and a life cycle assessment it, it, it is quite useful for that because it will allow you to see effectively if you are going to improve your, your environmental or social profile or not compared to the business as usual case. Just to follow that up, um, the first part of the question is, do you think mining companies should be involved in the products they generate and in the copper or the metal and follow how that metal is used through the whole life cycle? Do you think they should be involved in that? That's one way to see and then a more connection with the downstream uh, stakeholders in the value chains, which is very complex because of the dynamics of the mining activities. But also, they also have to connect more with their suppliers, material supplies, for instance, you know. It's, it's a whole <laughs> a very holistic approach in terms of all the connections you have to your process. Thanks, Juliana, for the presentation. I've read all of your papers. So I had tons of questions. You answered some of them. And I've got two pages of questions, but I'm going to go. Yes, I'm going to discuss with you later. <laughs> I don't want to hold you uh, all the day. But I'm going to go. <laughs> oh, OK. No, I'm not going to ask to it. <laughs> no, but... So I'm going to go back to where I'm more comfortable, OK? so. And you mentioned it briefly in your work. So especially around when we do the whole life cycle analysis, when it comes to mineral processing part and processing, we do simulation to understand essentially the impacts around energy and other consumptions and also revenue. But we know that actually, and as you mentioned, like the feed, there is variability in the feed and also in the process, we can change lots of stuff. So, uh, I mean, I thought of actually like the work that actually Conrad and Marco have been doing recently for Russell Minerals uh, equipment around uh, re redesigning liners for life. That we are, what we are doing, we're using JK Simmet in a kind of, by varying uh, factors that actually is, we know that needs changing in the mind and also optimization of the process as well, because 
uh, what you will find is that variability is going to have effect in the range of results that you're going to get and the optimization it might actually change the preference towards some of these uh, basically scenarios that you have and then running the Monte Carlo type of simulation as well to then provide that range because you've got range of factors that you can uh, change. So that's one aspect that I think uh, probably would be interesting, especially revisiting what you have done and using like SIMMET that we have, JK SIMMET that we have and do that. And the other one was, uh, there was a table that you had in a slide number 30 that actually I've been looking into technology from, for instance, how familiar we are and then how it's good to operate. So I found that it's a bit arbitrary in terms of you decide it's low, high, medium, but maybe using some approach like fuzzy logic that actually we can break each of those components into a bit sub components. Like for instance, around the familiarity, we can say, okay, how well is introduced this method, this equipment to other industry? How good we know about that? What's the complexity? And then if you start adding the fuzzy logic system into that to basically change that variability, we can actually condense that down into single parameter that's to our suggestion my question is because i'm not familiar with the life cycle assessment and i can see there are lots of criteria there that you have to evaluate to find which parameter is easy and the question that i have is is it possible that actually maybe apply kind of the same like a fuzzy logic approach around that because that's very good when you have qual qualitative assessment and and they've got multiple criteria to condense that, all of them, into something that actually can tell you now, considering all of these aspects, these are the options I would rank them. Uh, because what I was looking when you're presenting, you've been focusing on the ones that actually has a bigger change and you say, okay, this problem is better. But when you look like, for instance, when you go into the context of the country, it might be actually water is more important than what you already highlighted. And that was my uh, question for you because I'm not familiar with la my life cycle. Sorry. Yeah, it's a, it's a big question. Uh, but, uh, well, actually, there are several questions here. But, but the last one is the more the important. Last one is more important. Is yeah, actually, one of the biggest challenges here is, is to, to get to a, a decision, uh, to the best decision. Uh, among a range of scenarios when you have trade-offs in across uh, sustainability dimensions and also within the same dimension you can have trade-offs in terms of impact categories as we saw in the uh, the last case and this is why we definitely need to incorporate more tools we are actually uh, following up on our work uh, that was part of the impact project and was uh, related to to uh, um, uh, uh, evaluate from a holistic perspective uh, uh, the, um, the best uh, case in terms of uh, renewable energy versus diesel based for this particular case and context uh, using the criteria from environmental LCA using also social criteria uh, as the BRGM, the geological and French geological survey performed a social LCA for this plan. And also uh, some economic and technical criteria that were uh, also part of a, a publication from uh, that was uh, led by Exeter University. And all this informa information uh, is being compared uh, systematically using multiple criteria decision analysis uh, but it's actually uh, is challenging um, and very controversial in terms of aggregating all the impacts and go to a single indicator because it also involves uh, subjective choices in terms of of the perceptions of each decision maker so uh, what is usually recommended is to be transparent as much as possible and, and do a sensitivity analysis to see how the influence of the decision maker view uh, uh, affects the outcomes of this evaluation. But it's, yeah, but it's not straightforward. <laughs> I'm afraid we're out of time, so we should probably uh, continue the discussion in uh, 
kitchen area. Uh, we didn't really get to address, uh, there are lots of questions online. Um, don't really know what to do other than maybe ask people to email you personally. Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, yeah, and 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 the email address is on the on the screen. Um, yes, and the questions are still piling in. Um, maybe we'll take one question just to just to be fair. Um, all right, uh, I'm picking picking randomly. Um, do you believe we could conceptualize a method that reconciles the different approaches to assess the relative importance of each criteria? Meaning, how can you say scenario one is better than scenario two because 80% improved energy efficiency is more important than 90% improved water efficiency or any other example? Do we have a common, in quotes, KPI, such as carbon footprint, biodiversity index, or a set of KPIs to compare all impacts? Yeah, no, that's related to the last yes. question I had. It is, yes. And, and it's uh, through this type of multiple criteria decision analysis, it's also possible to combine quantitative criteria with qualitative criteria. Fantastic. Such as, yeah. Yep. Yes, I should have, uh, I should have realized that, like I said, I randomly picked a question. Uh, but yes, uh, everyone just, um, let's continue the conversation and also uh, let's email. Let, I encourage you to email Juliana. And yes, we can do that too. Um, next week, we will have a Zoom presentation from Dr. Guy Descharnais from Azisco Gold Royalties to talk on cognitive biases in, um, in the mining sector. Uh, so we're still happy to set up here in the lecture theater, but uh, do keep in mind that the speaker will be dialing in from Montreal in Canada, and we will see everyone then. Thank you. Thanks, Juliana.